All right. Um, you know, I thought our staff did an excellent job through the whole process, especially our whole recruiting staff that we have. Um, they're kind of the unsung heroes behind the scenes and um, really um, excited about that. And then, you know, this January was a little different. Um, it wasn't as stressful <laughs> as it usually um, is as far as um, all the different things that happen um, at the end recruiting. But um, we're really excited about um, two of the guys we added um, to our process. You know, we felt like last year on defense that, you know, we didn't play as well as we'd like, but I thought a glaring miss for us last year was, um, you know, we didn't get the 13 sacks out of a Jimmy Gilbert and all the pressures and hurries. And um, we have some guys on campus that we feel like can do it, but we um, found a young man that we think has special talent um, and Alex Changham. And, uh, you know, he's six foot, almost six three, six two and three quarters. He's 250 pounds. He runs around a four six. He's very fast and athletic. Um, and uh, we've, I've been able to have a lot of success with, um, you know, the Nigerian Cameroon young men. All of them have played well for us here at um, CU, and all of them have had opportunities in the pros for a while. So uh, I, I think he's another one in that line, and hopefully he'll be able to to do that. As you can see him here, he's powerful, he's big. Um, you know, he's he's built like David Platty, cut up real well. And uh, so he he's active. Um, and loves football. It, you know, it was an interesting recruiting process with him. And, uh, you know, as you can see how he can turn the corner, he can bend, he can rush, he's powerful. You know, he's one of those situations where as a freshman, not many people knew about him. Coach um, Gary Bernardi has that school, did a great job, kind of knew about him as a freshman. And uh, hadn't, didn't play a ton, kind of got into it. And then the coach kept talking to Gary, and we kept watching games, and we got on him. And, you know, he's a guy that um, – a lot of people started sniffing around on really late, um, and we were excited that he came here. And I'm excited about what he brings to the table for us. Um, and he'll, you know, he'll be here in, you know, in, in June. So uh, the next young man is Trayvon McMillan, um, which was a really interesting story. Um, uh, Trayvon um, is an excellent running back. You know, he went to uh, Virginia Tech um, as a quarterback, um, and then. Red shirted, and then Coach Beamer played him at tailback, and he had over over a thousand yards rushing his red shirt freshman year, um, and did a great job there. Coach Fiante, who's a great coach, also came in and has done a great job with the program, but does a lot of platooning with their running backs, and um, um, so he played his three other years and led the team in rushing. This year he didn't; he was leading the team in rushing, but then he didn't play in the bowl game. Um, and uh, so he can, he's an, a guy that can do all the things in the backfield. He's six foot, he's 210 pounds, he can catch, he can block, he can run. Um, he sought us out, and it's interesting, the first person he called, he didn't call us, he called Philip Lindsay to find out all about us. Uh, I thought that was really interesting. And uh, so uh, uh, we're excited about having uh, Trayvon join us. He'll, he's graduated from their business school and coming here and going to grad school for us, and um, we're excited about Trayvon. Uh, and what he brings. Um, also, I, I don't always talk about, um, you know, preferred walk-ons, but we've got an excellent preferred walk-on from uh, Cherry Creek and Dustin Johnson. Um, safety there, hitter, good player, really athletic. Um, and uh, I'm really excited about Dustin being a preferred walk-on coming in our program. And, you know, we have, we've had quite a few. Uh, Ryan Muller's a good example of a guy that, you know, kind of was special here from the state, and I think that Dustin has a chance to be a, a really good player for us and excited about him. Uh, so I'll take any uh, questions at this time. It's a little bit faster than usual. Um, so. What now? Uh, oh, excuse me, um, I didn't. Um, yeah, Kane and Ray, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, I, I just assumed he was one of them because we did, uh, went, it was all in that process time. Yeah, Kane and Ray is a, a young man that we had um, that was listed as our, really, our number one um, offensive lineman guard slash tackle. Um, we kind of list them like there's just tackles, and then we have guard slash tackles that could play both spots when we were looking at that on our boards. And uh, he was one of our number one guys, top guys, a year ago. Um, and uh, he committed and signed with UCLA, and then some things happened there, and um, the way it worked out, he got a release and never started there. So he's he's like a gray shirt for us, 
um, and uh, we're really excited about what he brings to the table, and I think he's an excellent football player um, that we are really excited about having, and that's kind of a uh, – that's truly an extra gift in your stocking, so to speak, when we, it happened, uh, you know, so a, a big surprise for you. So um, I was kind of, what's the, the Alexa, is that what you call it? Alexa, get me another guard or tackle, and it popped in my stocking, so I was pretty excited about that. Mike, I guess yes. uh, with, with Trayvon, um, you know, getting another running back, I know you've got uh, some seniors back, some yep. guys with some experience but not a ton. Um, can you talk about what it really means to have a guy with this type of experience coming right. back in to fill in for Philip? Right. I, you know, I do like our running backs that we have, um, but it's hard to pass up on a guy um, that's graduated from college. He played a lot of football, very big, and, and he's an all-phase running back, um, which helps you. He knows how to block. He understands pass protections. When he came in on his uh, official visit, you know, talking pass protections and things, he was, you know, like a vet. You know, it was awesome. Um, and then, you know, I'm really excited about Bo Bisharad. I'm excited about Kyle Evans. Uh, and, um, you know, we've got Donovan Lee, Alex Fontenot. Um, so we've got some guys in there um, that we're excited about. They also all play on special teams. They do all type of different things. But, um, you know, this was a unique situation that a young man sought us out and really wanted to be here. Um, had a lot of other opportunities to go a lot of other places. And uh, I'm excited about having him. I think he's an all-down back that can do everything. Mike, now that you've gone through the process, I'm, I'm wondering, you, you evaluate it. I know you said it's a more relaxed January, but is is what they've done with recruiting a good thing at this point, or should some adjustments be made, or what, what, what's your assessment? Well, what I meant by a more relaxed January, you weren't sitting on pins and needles. The kid was going to go somewhere else. Um, I was probably – I was just as busy or busier this January than I've ever been because I was kind of going out and – you know, going to high schools all over the country, watching 2019 guys play basketball, work out in the weight room, all of that. So it gave us a, a, an advantage. You know, assistant coaches come in and tell you about it. In the past, I wouldn't have been able to do that because um, I would be going to all the houses and the homes and just going to the certain schools that we had commitments at. So December, I'm kind of making a long answer here. December was really hectic because from after the Utah game to December, I, had to, I went in 21 homes, you know. Um, and so, and, uh, and visiting with parents and making sure those you know, those young men signed on December 20th. So that was hectic. Um, I um, I liked the early signing date. I'm still a proponent. I'm going to keep pushing it. Some people are gonna, still going to get mad at me. We now that we have official visits in April, May, and June, why don't kids if they take a few visits and they decide, hey, that's where I want to go to school, let's have a signing date in July, over the dead period, they sign, and now. You have another signing date in February. So do just like basketball does. They have a signing date in November, correct? And then they have a signing date in April. Why don't we do the same thing? And so um, that's what I keep proposing to do. And I think eventually that will happen. Um, and, you know, it's, it's sped up a lot. Also, the other thing that's happening, you have a lot more high school kids graduating early and coming into, in January. So that also helps you with that. So then if you sign a kid in July and he wants to do that, now you can talk to him all the time. You're able to get with the counselors. You're able to say you need to do this. So you have more communication with them to help them be ready to do that. So I think that's kind of the way with the future. Um, and, uh, um, and I think if I was a parent and a kid could do that, uh, he wasn't a double sport athlete, which I like to recruit a lot of double sport athletes. So it's kind of, you know, uh, um, situation there. But uh, I think that uh, that's something that might be trending towards the future. Given the heavy early numbers. Yes. And going through this for the first time, both signing dates, did you pick, did you learn anything both among yourselves and in consultation with colleagues that you might use going forward? And I'm also wondering, did you run into any remorse on guys who signed early? Uh, no, we didn't run into any remorse on guys that we signed. We, we, our staff does an excellent job of evaluating. We always have, I believe, um, as far as you can tell by our first and second classes. So many guys still playing and going and doing and, and you know, developing. Um, but I, the exciting thing about this class to me, I said it the first time, is we have more guys developed earlier that are ready to play. Like a, a Frank Phillip, there's, it's rarely been that we've been able to sign an offensive lineman that's going to come in at 280-plus, playing really good football, really bright, that I think right now – can step on the field and play as a freshman. Now, does he not? I don't know, but I think he can. Um, that's, to me, you know, we have a Israel Antoine 
uh, defensive tackle that's 285 pounds, built like a Greek god, that I think can step on the field as a true freshman and play, uh, and play well and win with. So usually you're having to develop those guys. We're able to kind of we that early evaluation, the process of that, um, and kind of where we've moved up in the food chain, so to speak, with kids realizing they can be successful here, um, has helped us. As far as the, a little bit more on your question about um, being able to look at some things we did, I don't think I'm going to give away any trade secrets, uh, but there's definitely things that we've talked about that we would do a little different uh, along the way that, that would help us. And then this year is a whole different ball of wax, too, having official visits in April, May, and June, you know, around recruiting, around um, camps, all those things. you got to kind of weigh that if you bring too many guys in and then they still want to take visits later on. So you, you only get so many visit opportunities, so we've got to really look at that. So we're really trying to dive into exactly how to do that um, to be the best, most successful we can be. Hassan Hippolyte's another guy that hadn't signed. Oh, yeah. Can you I love detail, Hassan. <laughs> can you kind of detail his recruitment and what he's going to add to the mix? Yeah, I, I love all our guys. Hassan's another guy, when you meet him in person, you're going to go, that's a freshman. Um, and he, you know, he's built really well. He'll hit you. Um, he's very physical. He's very athletic. Um, he's explosive. Um, he reminds me a lot, and I sh I'm not going to put this on him, but he reminds me a lot of what Roy Williams was at the Dallas Cowboys. Roy, he's built like Roy. You know, Roy's, he's 200 and something pounds already as an 18-year-old. And when I got Roy, when I coached Roy, he was like 220, 225, and, but younger. But he has that explosion and that build, and he's built like a running back, but he has great hips and he can flip and he can move. And, um, yeah, as you can tell, I'm really excited about Hassan. He's another guy that I'm going to try to give an opportunity to throw out there on special teams early, could be a, a guy that's a, able to hopefully help us play some this year because I think he's that physically set and ready to go. Mike, you talked about your pass rush and, and uh, Chang have been able to help fill that. Are there other guys in this class that you think will come in, uh, could come in right away and, and help you in that regard? Uh, on the pass rush, yeah, we're, we're looking at some guys. You know, of course, we got um, uh, Nuamato back. I, can't, I don't have to say NJ anymore, in Nuamato. Um, and so we feel like that he has the ability to pass rush for us. So he's not really a signee, but he's a guy that's back. Uh, excited to see what the changes in, in his life and his, his, you know, his mom I've known forever because I signed his older brother and we're really close. Um, and uh, so, but we have, you know, Gustav, um, a young man from Germany, by the way, of um, Aquinas High School in California. He's athletic and can run and rush off the edge. Um, and then, you know, we've got some other guys. Um, I make sure I don't miss anybody here um, that we like. Of course, um, the other guy, um, um, Davion uh, Taylor, um, uh, I believe he's a buff. He's an outside linebacker. He was ranked the number one outside linebacker in America out of junior college. He'll play our buff position that Ryan Moeller played. Um, he's very athletic. He's very fast. He's 225 pounds. You know, he runs a 10, 500 meters. Um, I'm really excited about him. He'll be able to pass rush for us and, and do that. So um, he's a guy that I see that could pass rush out of that class. There's other guys too, but um, I don't. Um, he's a guy that's already here, you know, already here working out and be practicing in the spring. Want to ask you about uh, Fallow? Yeah. Um, kind of a two-part question on him, but one, he's played inside and outside. Right. So I'm curious where you really see him this time? We will keep him outside. When we played him inside, there's always a – he's a really good athlete, but sometimes you, you, you've seen this before, even in the NFL when they move a guy and he try to move him inside, he kind of freezes up. He's better off the edge. He sees better. He reacts better. So we'll keep him on the edge. I've always had the tendency to want to put him in there, but he's, he kind of um, – he doesn't react as well in there. It's too much going on, but when he sees it from the edge and can run it and seek it down and do that – and. I, I really believe he'll make a jump in his pass rushing ability, just like Jimmy made a jump in his pass rushing ability his junior and senior year. And then just kind of off field with him, you've had some success bringing guys back mm -hmm. um, that have that have run into some trouble, the latest one being Evan Worthington, uh, uh, Samson in the past, uh -huh. things like that. What have you seen out of out of? By the uh, way, Samson's got a full time job at Costco, mm -hmm. dating a young lady. Seriously, we talk. I'm so I'm, I'm excited for Samson. But go ahead. You've had success with these guys and bringing them back and giving them that second chance. And what are you seeing so far in the couple of weeks that he's been back? That uh, I've seen a, uh, a new, uh, you know, he's always been a good kid. I mean, I've known him since he was in seventh grade. So there's a lot of connection there. Um, and his um, mom, Becca, you know, his dad died when he was in fifth grade. And I kind of started knowing him after that. And his mom, Becca, with his older brother, Nate, who played for me at um, San Jose State. 
Um, I, I, I've seen a, a young man that realizes his opportunities, realize the responsibility to his family, to himself, and um, you know, truly cared about. I've seen a new brightness in his eyes, if that makes sense. You know, you see people that go through them, they, they have that brightness in their eyes, and I see that, and I'm excited about um, um, what new, new motto. I'm, I hope I'm saying it right. I keep asking, making sure I pronounce it correct, but um, uh, what he brings to the table. So hopefully he'll do well. You talked about 2019 recruiting in January. Yeah. Is that almost kind of replaced now, the spring evaluation period? How many more offers would yeah. you say you have out now? Yeah, um, it, it does. Um, you know, the head coach can't go out in May anymore. Um, and so it's hard for you um, when guys come in and say, hey, this guy's, you know, he's a beast. He's 6'3", he's 220 pounds. And they tell you the other guy's a beast. He's 6'3", 200. So you're trying to watch him on film. And now if you see him in person, you go, yeah, that guy, he is 6'3", 220. That guy, he's 6'1", 205. Now you can compare apples and oranges and you kind of figure it all out when you're watching it. And, you know, getting to watch them do something in the weight room or getting to watch them on the track or getting to watch them in a, a mat workout at their school or getting to watch them play basketball, um, all those type of things help you in an evaluation process. Um, so, yes, for the head coach, I, I, I like that part of it. Um, and, I, you know, I, was, I went to a ton of schools. I was hitting about six schools a day every day, you know, through there. And um, so that, that, was, that was good. Um, so it does help us back. Now, we do have more guys we're definitely going to offer. We're in the process now of going back over all those guys, putting our board up like we want. Um, and, you know, we're excited about some of the guys that we've offered and, you know, all that type of thing. So, Coach, not a recruiting question per se, but you've added yep. three new assistant coaches yeah. over the past month or so. Uh, I guess, how do you feel about how they've kind of assimilated into what you're trying to do here so far? Right. Um, they've done an excellent job. I'm excited about all three guys. Y'all going to get to meet them here um, in a minute. Um, you know, they're excellent people, excellent coaches, um, have been very energetic in our, um, you know, um, morning um, workouts with our players and, you know, in the, in the weight room and all that. I've been excited about that. They did an excellent job when they went out on the road there a little bit. And uh, so I think that's I exciting um, and what they bring. It's always, um, you know, adding a 10th coach has been good too. Um, and uh, so I'm excited about uh, that. You know, Ashley's been here before. He was, you know, just chomping at the bit to come back. Um, and I had talked to him a couple other times in the process when we had some openings. And, you know, it all goes back. You kind of hear it all the time. It goes back to the fit. And that goes with any business, right? And you kind of think, well, it just didn't, this time was a perfect fit for us. Uh, uh, um, you know, Kurt Roper, I've known, we've known each other for since 19, shoot, we're both coaches' sons. I think it was 1990, when was it? 19, when did we go? 1998 um, is when we started coaching together um, in the Independence Bowl against Texas Tech um, with Coach Cut. So we've known each other a long time and uh, worked right beside each other on the offensive side of the ball when I was at Ole Miss. For Coach Cut, and then I moved to the defense, and um, we've stayed in great contact and touch throughout the years. And um, it was really a, a blessing that he, um, we were able to get him, and he was he he wanted to be here and, and excited about what he'll do with the quarterbacks. Um, Kawan Drake uh, is a young man that um, we interviewed quite a few D line coaches, and uh, he blew me away on his interview uh, with his personality, his intensity, and his knowledge. Uh, and, and he's another. He's a, his grandfather was a, was a Hall of Fame coach in, in, in New Orleans high school football. So he's been in, in his whole life, um, and so uh, I'm excited about that. And I think Ashley's with us. Um, you know, having so much success in the secondary and at corners, Ashley brings that playing 13 years in it. Now coached a while, he's really seasoned. He'll be really able to help those young men and, and, and understand that. And he, he's a great technician in what he does. You uh, earlier you mentioned you really like multi-sport athletes. Yeah. Uh, so Davion Taylor, I know he's going to play track here. He's yes. He's excited about that. For you, what are the biggest pros and perhaps any negatives about multi-sport, about, about them playing well, multiple sports? What I believe about multi-sport athletes um, is, okay, if two guys are even, all right, and we're watching them on film, we know them, <laughs> basically same, age, same grade situation, same size, same athletic ability, and I'm watching them, and I go, okay, um, so and so, well, he just plays football. So, number one, I know that he's in the weight room all the time. He's coached by the same coach. He's kind of in the same environment all the time. When football's over, he's got a little bit of downtime. He's not playing games each week. He's not traveling. He's not doing all those type of things. And then I look at another young man, same situation, and he plays football. He plays basketball. He runs track or he plays baseball. 
okay? That young man is having to time management better, okay? He's not in the weight room all the time. He's playing multiple sports. So he's learning other skills, but he's not built up. Um, so he has more development stage. He has, he's having to deal with three different head coaches. He's having to be in three different locker rooms. He's having to be in all these different dynamics of a basketball court situation, a track situation. So to me, he's more well-rounded. I've got a better chance of him being successful and having more upside in college than I do the other guy. Now, the other guy might just end up being just as good, but percentage-wise, there's seven guys now that I've coached, Isaiah being the seventh one, um, in the secondary that were multi-sport athletes that were over a 3.0 coming out of high school all seven of those played in the NFL five years or longer. So I kind of stick by that. And there's some guys out there recruiting that I'm looking at just like that, and I tell them that exact story. So um, I, I, that's, that's, that's why I do it. So that's my uh, um, experience from it. And it's, and it's worked out well for us. Mike, I was hoping you could double back a little bit about Kurt Roper. Just yeah, yeah, you yeah. guys have so much history together. What is it about his work with quarterbacks that made you feel so confident bringing him in to work with Steven? Well, he learned from who I think is the best quarterback coach in America, David Cutcliffe. Um, and, uh, you know, his first person he coached was a guy named Eli Manning. Um, and, uh, he, you know, he was there Eli Manning's um, redshirt year. And then he, you know, he coached him then and did, learned everything from Cut and then kept working with him and, and did all that. He's developed many pro quarterbacks at the different stops along the way. Um, and, uh, and then going back and working with him at Duke after we kind of been away from each other for a little while and we kind of came back when we were older and, and watching what he did with Duke's offense and what he did with the quarterbacks at Duke. Um, and uh, he has two quarterbacks from Duke in the NFL right now. Um, and uh, so he, he's an unbelievable fundamental coach, really gets along well with the staff. And, uh, you know, we talked um, in depth. I said, you know, all I have is the quarterback spot. I don't have a coordinator and, and anything like that. He said, no, I, I, that's what I want to do. I want to be with the quarterbacks. I want to do that. And um, so I was excited about him because he could have gone some other places to be coordinators um, this year. Um, but he wanted to come here and wants to be part of what we're doing. And he's excited about all the quarterbacks we have and, and what we do. And I'm excited about having Kurt and Britt and um, his whole family with us. You've done a great job coaching defensive backs in your career and, and helped out with, uh, with It's that. good players. I, good players makes you a good coach. <laughs> and, and you did that this last year uh, uh -huh. with Shadon. Bringing um, Ashley on, what's the benefit for you personally in, in your role as head coach? Well, um, you know, it – it enables me to I kind of work with them and we kind of do it all together and coach it. I'll still be involved, um, but it, it enables me to, um, uh, you know, have a little bit more um, viewing of the entire offense or defense, so to speak, but not a, not a lot. Um, uh, you know, I kind of enjoy doing drills with the DBs. It kind of lets me have an escape for 10 minutes during, the, you know, during practice and that type of thing. Um, but uh, I'll, uh, you know, just keep working w just like I did with Charles Clark um, when he was here, you know, coaching the corners. Um, and, it, and it worked out well. I felt like when we switched to the 3-4 that we needed two linebacker coaches after going through it a year or two that, you know, you got outside backers, you got the buff, you got the inside backers. And if a guy tries to do all four of those, somebody gets neglected. So when we had the other spot, after going through it, when we had the um, coaching changes, I felt like it would be better I could help in the secondary. And then I knew the 10th coach was coming along. Now we could be back to, to balance, and it would be better. And we'd, I'd have everything set and, and good for our, for our defense. So now every spot gets touched. Does, does that make sense? Okay. Hey, Mac, I a little bit of an off-recruiting question for you. Um, you. You got a chance to see Mason Rudolph front and center here in the bowl game yeah, last yeah, yeah. year. Uh -huh. Are you a little surprised he's not getting a little bit more love based on what, what you evaluated him as? Uh, yeah, um, I, I really don't know what's going on with him. I'm sorry, I don't watch any of that. Um, but I do, I, th I do believe Mason Rudolph is an excellent quarterback. Uh, I, I think he's a phenomenal deep ball thrower. And I know in the NFL – um, you know, you have to be accurate. But big plays are such a critical situation in being on target downfield. I think you saw that the other night in the Super Bowl, how on target um, the quarterback for the um, uh, Philadelphia Eagles was on a couple of those down, deep downfield throws that made a difference in the football game. And I think that's something he does excellent. But, you know, it's funny. You know, you go through all these drafts every year, and it seems like the guy that's kind of a little bit forgotten always ends up being the guy later on. 
I mean, it, it really does. Um, now, I know some of them have done well, but it just kind of seems that way. If you look at – even look at the two guys in the Super Bowl the other night, um, I thought that was interesting. Um, and that kind of is the way it works out usually. Um, so I, I think he's – I can think he can play for somebody and uh, somebody will take him. And the other thing that you look at for quarterbacks, and this is, this is not my thought on it, was what Bill Parcells used to always say, um, was, you know, how many snaps do they get in college? You know, you can't replace that experience out there. And, uh, you know, he played a lot of snaps at Oklahoma State. Um, and uh, um, and I, know that, I know that Mike Gundy thought a lot of him, and um, he, he won a lot of football games for Oklahoma State. Football's in your blood, in your family, in your tree, everything. So football's done a lot for your family. Are you having to start to deal with explaining to parents or answering parents' questions about whether the game is safe in this in this era, um, a, a little bit. Um, you know, of course, it's all over the media. Um, you know, the, the, the things that I would say it's safer than it's ever been. Um, and you know, as as y'all know, the stats and different thing. You know, um, there's more concussions and that type of thing in women's soccer. You know, there's all you know all these other things. You know, I always tell them, I always, when they ask me that, and I, I'm being serious, I mean, we can all sit in front of the television and play Xbox, right? Um, now we're going to be obese. We're going to die of heart disease. You know, there's all these different things you have going on. Um, I, I, I believe in the game um, tremendously. But at the, at the same time, you know, I, I always ask, does your son ride a bicycle? And they go, yeah. I said, well, he's a lot more in trouble riding that bicycle than he is ever playing football. It's a proven fact. Does he ride skateboards? Oh, yeah, he skateboards. I go by a place all the time near my house. There's kids skateboarding all the time, flipping. and doing. That's a lot more dangerous than playing football. Um, and it's statistically proven, and it, it's, it all weighs out. So um, I think that it's a thing that's on the forefront right now. Um, and, yes, we've gotten better at the game. We've, we've helped change the rules. The, the helmets have gotten better, um, how we – teach tackling, all that type of stuff. So I still think it's a phenomenal sport. But I do get asked about it some. But those are some things they go, oh, that's right. He does ride the bicycle. He does skateboard. You know, and I said, well, yeah, we've taken him to the hospital for those things. <laughs> so um, uh, I think that there's a lot of uh, issues out there that attack football. Uh, but I still think it's a, a phenomenal game. Just really quick, I haven't had a chance to ask you about all the coaching changes in the Pac-12 South. It looks like the South just got a lot more fun. Um, yeah, I, there, there is a lot of coaches. I don't know many of those guys at all. I'll, I'll, I'll get to meet them. I think that uh, we also lost some excellent coaches, and I'm still scratching my head um, on a couple of them. And uh, so, um, but I, I, you know, that's the that's the beast of our business. Um, and uh, but like I always say, you know, we coach, but players make plays. Players win games. So I'm more concerned about the players they got than really all the coaches they got. To be honest with you. Mike, this might have been something you've addressed in the past, but now that there's a new state law that eliminates the cap on multi-year contracts yes. for state employees and give your assistants these multi-year contracts, when you're out there on this coaching search, is that a benefit to you? Do you think it's, it was a detractor before <laughs> to try to sell these guys w without that? It's a tremendous benefit. Um, I'll be honest with you, I, I, um, I would have taken the job anyway, but I had no clue when I took the job that I was the only person on the staff that had a contract. Um, and uh, that's a tough deal in, in our world that we live in. It's such a tumultuous world. Um, and, uh, yes, it was very hard. Um, it was also, um, you know, uh, harder to, to, to get coaches, sometimes harder to keep coaches, um, all those types of things. Um, I'm um, very excited about um, what we've done. I'm pretty sure that Mike Bobo and CSU and them are happy about it also. Um, and I, I think it's a, a great benefit. But here's the other side. You know, we, we talk about football mainly in that. But, I mean, um, think about Danny Sanchez that just walked out of here. Now he gets a contract, but he should. You know, he deserves it. He's earned it. Um, you know, all the minors, not the minor sports, all the Olympic sports, um, are those guys, those, the head coaches weren't even on contracts. I mean, that's amazing to me. Um, so I think it benefits everything, um, and uh, it's, it's a win-win for to me for all sports and the stability of the of the um, programs. Um, and I and I'm I'm excited about it, and uh, I'm you know I'm glad that that was able to uh, 
glad people were able to see it, understand it, and, and the scope of it, of what it means. And the guys like uh, Trayvon, uh, the grad transfers that uh -huh. signed those, those financial aid agreements yep. that, are, that are the non-binding agreements uh -huh. we saw two years ago with Well, they're Davis. binding for us. Right, <laughs> for them, but like we saw two years ago with Davis yeah. Webb that uh, teams can still recruit them, and, right. and you're not sure if you're going to get that guy until he shows up on campus. With all the talk about the, the transfer rules, have you heard any talk about that part of it being fixed or, or changed? Um, there, I have heard a little bit about that. Um, um, you know, the, all of it's in theory right now, of course, and we discussed a lot of it at our head coaches' meetings and at the AFCA convention. Um, but, uh, you know, I definitely hope he comes. I, I believe he's coming. He's gave his word. Um, you know, but there'll be people still trying to talk to him. But I, I feel very good about, about um, Trayvon. Um, on the other side, of, yeah, there's been talk that if a grad transfer decides to transfer and you're, you're doing that, that when you sign them, it is binding to just you and the school. So this doesn't happen because, you know, you're working on getting them in grad school, they're applying, you're doing all those type of things. So it's kind of, and they have to do it in a certain amount of time to get in grad school. Um, that takes somebody else's place in grad school because not everybody has all the options of grad school. It's not as big a limit as there is in, you know, undergrad. We all understand that. So I think there's a lot of um, situations there that um, would hold for them to be a binding to both of us. And I think that is something that has been brought up. Yeah, I definitely would like to see that. I, there, there, there's no doubt. Mike, sort of another question off this assistant coach's topic here. Sort of another national trend we've seen is just kind of a boom in the salaries for these guys, even just compared to the last decade, seeing you know coordinators and assistants making multi-millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. What do you make of that? Obviously, this is a business, and these guys make what they earn. Right. But at the same time, do you see potential issues down the roads with some of these salaries just getting bigger and bigger and, and kind of seeing what the resources your school has? Right. Um, uh, you know, I, I think part of it's, you know, like uh, the Big Ten will probably announce a huge um, TV revenue they're going to get here in a few days. SEC gets, I don't know what, they got $43 million or something last year, and they're probably going to get more this year. I think that's why that's been able to happen, um, the TV money. Um, and, uh, you know, um, but, you know, certain conferences are disproportionate in that, so eventually that would make a, there might be a gap there. Um, and so hopefully it's not, but there might be a gap there on that. Um, so, um, but, you know, and, and, and I always, you know, people talk about football coaches or basketball coaches and that type of thing and sometimes say, oh, you're making a lot of money. Y yes, that's true. Okay, I understand that. But do they say that about the lawyer? Do they say that about the doctor? Do they say that about other people that start their Google company and then they get hired from Google to Apple? So. Yeah. Yes, we're in the media, but there, you know, people are making good salaries other places too. So I think it's, you know, it's all relative. So we need to have three signing dates next year. Get three, three lunches. <laughs> oh, every, oh. <laughs> oh, I'll see. Now we're going to have something on the twenty second of February before we start spring practice. Okay. Ah, oh, there won't be anybody here. All right. Thanks, guys.